Hello everyone and welcome to this session of Literary Criticism for the NPTEL course. Uh, this session is on Afra Bain, who is quite a prominent and yet a simultaneously minor figure in the restoration canon of literature in England. So Afra Bain is most commonly known as a playwright in the restoration era and it can be argued and has been argued that she is one of the most popular uh, playwrights in the restoration era. She was born in 1630 in England and she died in 1689. Uh, lack of birth records or any other form of documentation whatsoever makes it difficult to place the exact uh, date at which she was born or the exact place in England where she was born, but it is commonly believed that she is the daughter of uh, a barber and a wet nurse. Um, in, sometime in 1663, she lived in Suriname in the West Indies for nearly a year. She went with her father and her mother and her father died. Uh, she came back a year later and she met, and it is believed or documentation leads us to believe that she met a Dutch merchant with some variation of the spelling B-E-H-N, Bain, and she married him, but there's no further mention of him and it's believed that he either died or left her, which is when she began writing to support herself because she needed the money. In, and, the, and she started writing in 1665, which was uh, the height of the Restoration Era. If you know English history, you know that Charles II was restored to the throne in 1660. That was when the monarchy came back to England after the Republic, which was headed by Cromwell. Um, in 1665, she began writing and she began writing verse. That's how she started off her literary career. But it, it didn't bring in too much money. Possibly the fact that she was a woman, possibly the fact that uh, she wasn't as popular and also possibly the fact that perhaps she didn't have contacts. But in 1668, she undertook some spying work for uh, Charles II in, in Amsterdam, I think, probably because of her Dutch connection, for which uh, her letters and her diaries show that she was never paid. Although she repeatedly asked Charles II for reimbursement, he never did and she was thrown into debtor's prison. And that's also when she took to the pen seriously in, in order to bring in some income that could get her out of prison, out of debtor's prison, which was uh, not, it, it didn't reflect very well upon your status if you were thrown into prison for bankruptcy at that point of time. So moving on. In 1665, she started off by writing verse, okay, and and her poetry was more classical than metaphysical, which meant that she drew inspiration from more from Ben Jonson and other uh, people who and other poets and playwrights who followed classical traditions more than she did from John Donne or or rather more what could be called more experimental poets of those days. Mm. She wrote about contemporary events. She, uh, she she wrote about situations that she had first-hand experience in and uh, people that she knew and these weren't masked very well, whether it was in her verse or in her dramas. Uh, they were masked, certainly, but they were masked just enough that people in her circle would know whom she was referring to. So it's also seen as a form of satire and she was very, very good at it. Astria is a speaker in Bain's poems. Uh, this is a speaker that Bain creates and uh, if it's not a first person speaker, then the speaker is usually Astria in most of her poems. And this Astria is a figure with a very definite voice, with very definite opinions. There's no vagueness as to who the speaker is in the poems. If it's not first person I, referring directly to the poet as herself, it is Astria. Astria was also her code name for when she was performing espionage work for Charles II. Uh, now it's it's interesting to note that although her verse didn't draw as much uh, attention and as drama as her dramas did, she's well known for her plays rather than for her verse and later on she's known for her novel Orunoku which we'll perhaps take a very brief look at. But 
the the structure and the pattern of the poetry that she uses uh, is 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 a very traditional one. So it's not experimental. She's not trying out new forms or trying to revive uh, extremely forgotten archaic old ones. She's following ones that she's following patterns that Johnson used himself, and and these verses have uh, or, or these structures have. Uh, a sort of unquestioned acceptance uh, regarding the meaning that the structure has. So, if a certain kind of structure is used, it's it's understood that uh, it's it's meant for a certain kind of poem. So, uh, villanelles would perhaps signify a certain thing. If you're writing a poem of political protest, it would mean a different kind of structure. If you were writing one for courtship, it would mean another kind of structure, and so, if, if you used one kind of structure, it's understood that this is the genre of poetry that, you're in, that you use it for. But with Bain, the reason that uh, she, she was probably looked upon so unfavorably or the reason why she caused such a stir is that she broke this relationship. She did not uh, follow this unquestioned, uh, very uh, timely, uh, time-honored and accepted pattern, but she would use different structures for different genres of poetry that weren't featured very much or that that probably weren't done very commonly or that weren't done by quote unquote the great classicists like Johnson, which probably drew a lot of uh, unfavorable attention towards her. Uh, apart from apart from this, apart from the verse and how she wrote her poems, uh, she also drew inspiration from uh, the lyricism that that uh, Philip Sidney used or Edmund Spencer used, rather than, as I said, more experimental poetry like John Donne. And Shakespeare was definitely her. Shakespeare was definitely a, a huge influence on her. And it's also important to note that. Uh, the most authoritative version of her life is that she is the daughter of uh, of a barber somewhere in Kent, I think. And questioning how a daughter of someone like a barber in Kent in 1600s in England had access to these kinds of resources where you could educate yourself uh, into a classical tradition. I use into very deliberately because these forms of education were restricted to a certain group of people from certain economic classes alone. And, and, and not just that, she was a woman as well, she was a girl. So for her to uh, possibly uh, come across connections, make use of them, uh, have access or, or gain access by whatever means she did, because none of this is uh, ever documented anywhere to these to a classical tradition to an accepted tradition that that was in existence in England and in Europe at the time is extremely resourceful of her and not just to gain access to it but to gain access to it to educate herself into it and to make use of it for her to produce her own writing is is quite remarkable uh, but then again, apart from the scandalous attention that her verse drew, in the beginning at least it didn't draw too much attention. And that's probably why she turned to writing for the stage, because she saw that these were more profitable, that this was a more profitable avenue for her to live upon than writing poetry. Also keep in mind that her contemporaries in poetry were people like Dryden and uh, uh, the Earl of Rochester, John Wilmot, who had a certain stamp, a certain seal of approval from the court of Charles II. So they were already established in a sense and, and Bain was still possibly fighting her way against this or making her way into this, this uh, pantheon of, of male verse and literature. Mm. All women together ought to let flowers fall upon the tomb of Afra Bain, for it was she who earned them the right to speak their minds. This is what Virginia Woolf wrote in 1929 in her book called uh, A Room of One's Own. Not a book, but a series of essays called Room of One's Own. And the reason Woolf says this is because uh, Afra Bain is the first woman who took up writing to make a living by it. 
Yes, there were other women writers before her, during her time and after her, but these were from a certain class or they were from an elite aristocratic class where they were not forced to write uh, in order to make a living, in order to survive. They wrote for self-expression, for enjoyment and also because they had access to education and wanted to perhaps pit their wits and see where they stood against uh, their male contemporaries. But it was not imperative that any of them write. For Bain, however, it was extremely imperative that she wrote because this was the only way that she could get herself out of bankruptcy because she could help, she could expect no help from the state. Mm. Bain was also writing in, uh, in, she, she was writing in a man's world with male value systems throughout and conforming to them at certain times and at other times uh, appropriating them for her own needs and perhaps at other times defying them outright. So, for instance, uh, there's, there's a section, uh, a preface to one of her plays where she defends the charge of licentiousness that uh, have been brought against all of her plays. Uh, it, it, is, it was common opinion that her plays was, were too ribald, were too bawdry, were too lewd for public uh, viewing, for public consumption. And Bain outright states that uh, the plays she's written, had they been written by a man, would raise no eyebrows and no questions. But simply because it's been written by a woman, all of these charges are being brought against them. And she uh, dares any of her critics or her contemporaries to hold up a play that she has written against one that has been written by Dryden or Shadwell or any of her other contemporaries at that time. And to point out a single instance of her being more uh, lewd than her male contemporaries are and she says if you even find one instance where that can be so then I will accept all of your criticisms humbly without any objection. So this is uh, a single instance of uh, perhaps a fraction of what she had to face uh, being a woman in a man's world especially at a time on the restoration stage. Um, not just that, uh, keep in mind that uh, she's coming from or she's following or she's uh, next in line in a long tradition of essayists and critics who've debated how drama should be done, how literature should be done, what are the values of literature, uh, what are the values of poetry, uh, what are the, the rules that drama should follow, the unities for instance that Johnson was pretty insistent upon. And you'll remember that Philip Sidney says that it should uh, teach as well as delight. And this is something that Dryden says as well. He says that drama should instruct as, or, or not instruct as well as delight. He says that drama should instruct delightfully, if I'm not wrong. And, and all of these speak to a certain uh, moral value that they intend drama to have. And although this is commonly not associated with restoration drama, the fact that uh, people who wrote in the Restoration era and the Neoclassical era, the fact that they thought this is extremely important. Bain, on the other hand, uh, again, in one of uh, her prefaces to one of her plays, I think it's the Lucky Chance, uh, sees no point in debating the value of drama or the usefulness of drama. Mm. She says that it is entertainment for any educated man, that is what drama is, and to debate about how useful it is or what kind of value it should promote or uh, what kind of rules it should follow is is completely pointless and she says it quite boldly. Afra Bain was probably one of the most popular playwrights. Uh, there's evidence to show that uh, that her contemporaries Dryden and Shadwell, Dryden for instance was commissioned to write about three plays a year and he was commissioned by the court or by certain theatre companies to write three plays a year. So no matter how uh, badly these plays did, he would receive a certain sum of money for them for every play that he wrote. But commissions like this weren't extended to women and least of all to Afra Bin. Uh, she had no such commission and her plays lived uh, only as long as they lived, to put it very bluntly. 
uh, if the play she wrote, if it was a success, it was a success and that's when she got her money. And even the successes depend depended on uh, a night to night turnout of the audience. So she was literally living from day to day, from play to play. And if, if she invested all her time and energy and money in writing a play and having it performed and nobody showed up, well, that was too bad. She wouldn't get paid for it. But it wasn't like that for the men. Now, despite all of this, uh, Afra Bain's plays were performed by some of the most popular theatre actors that were there during the Restoration era. Uh, there was a time at which uh, she would have about 18 plays on, on the stage in a year and uh, Dryden would have perhaps 13 or 14 and even Shadwell would have only 14. She was outstripping all of them in terms of uh, the number of plays she had up on stage and the amount of audience she was drawing for each of her plays. And yet, she's mentioned as, as, as a token figure in the Restoration canon. When you think of Restoration comedy, you think or of Restoration drama in general, you'll think of Congreve, of Witcherly, when you think of the neoclassical era, you'll think of Dryden, of Pope. And Bain is just sort of hanging there in between the two because her drama is most certainly a uh, Restoration drama. But she's also written poetry, she's also written a novel. Uh, Orunoku is considered a prototype of the first English novel ever and yet she's accorded a uh, status that she probably would not have been accorded had she been a man. She would have probably been more popular had she been a man who'd written all of these things and done all of these wonderful amazing things. But that's not the case. Uh, we see her as, as a woman who has mobility in a man's world certainly she's she's uh, she's educated although she's taken upon herself to have that education she's traveled she's traveled to the west indies which was uh, not a very common thing for women in her time to do uh, she's drawn from her experience she's written uh, verse drama and literature she's uh, she's been a spy she's traveled to amsterdam as well she's uh, uh, quote unquote, she's in the literary circle of the time, although she got there with a lot of effort. But this kind of mobility that we see her having is also one that she's been forced to have. It's not, it's, a, it's not like she came from a background where she was well fed and well educated and monetarily secure enough to venture into these circles uh, thinking that she had uh, uh, a second plan to fall back upon or, or a safe uh, society net to fall back into if things should go wrong. She had no other choice. She was forced to be this way and she's made an, ex an excellent success of it. Um, sometimes even to the point that her contemporaries have been e eclipsed, Bain's written a poem called The Disappointment and it's about, uh, she takes the, the story of Leander and Cloris and Leander comes upon Cloris in, in, in the woods one day and he's extremely infatuated by her and he tries to make advances but Cloris uh, is, is not uh, very receptive of them. She's not receptive of them at all actually and uh, she swoons and she comes to and she finds Leander in, in a state of semi-potency uh, and, uh, and, and, and she just flees and this is Bane's uh, this is Bain's uh, writing of the poem and it's, it's commonly agreed among critics that the intended meaning of the poem is that Cloris uh, runs away because she, she doesn't want Leander and she doesn't want his advances. But male crit but interestingly, uh, it, it, it's also been argued and it's also common enough to argue that the reason Cloris rushes away is because she is uh, terrified and perhaps not terrified but she's extremely modest and shy and she doesn't know how to react because she's inexperienced and all of that and Bain has a very different take on this she says that Cloris simply did not want it and uh, never did and that's why she ran away and Leander is left uh, extremely angry at the end now this is the poem that she's written and John Wilmot who who, who's known as the Earl of Rochester and was also known, known as an extremely licentious uh, uh, poet and cavalier in Charles II's court. 
has also written a similar poem called The Imperfect Enjoyment, which deals with the similar theme of male impotency, except in the end of his poem, he recovers and uh, he's able to uh, do the deed, so to speak. But when Bain's poem was published, it was first uh, thought to be one of Rochester's poems and it was published in a collection of Rochester's poems. And uh, the fact that a, a woman not simply wrote but dared to write about something like this, uh, about a theme such as female enjoyment or female sexuality, shocked a lot of people. And it, it didn't draw her any favorable uh, attention from people who could make or break her reputation. Bain is very self-aware of the fact that uh, education and access to education is uh, restricted to a privileged few. And this is seen in the way in which she uh, writes her prefaces to her plays and directs them to an audience because uh, most of her prefaces and sometimes her epilogues to her plays are responding to charges. We see her responding to charges of licentiousness, of uh, ribaldness, of uh, women writing on this, uh, for the stage, of women being popular enough, of, of dealing with topics, of women dealing with topics that are traditionally not meant to be dealt with, like female uh, sexuality and sensuality and enjoyment. And so, so you see her answering a lot of these charges in her prefaces and the epilogues of her plays. The Rover, uh, Abdelazer, The Lucky Chance, these are just a few of her plays where her prefaces are extremely strong. And in these, uh, and in one such preface, she, uh, she talks about learning and about how learning and education are the privilege of men because it has been so all of this while. But you, you also see that uh, and be because it's been restricted to men, men are definitely above women or are better educated than women. But, and, and, this is the, and this is the argument we understand that has been leveled at her, that she's a woman with, uh, no, uh, with no traditional or classical learning to speak of. Uh, how dare she write? And she's answering this by saying, yes, definitely men are better educated than women, but that is only because education has been restricted uh, to the privileged few men. However, if we are to go according to the tradition that you male figures hold so highly, then uh, Shakespeare and Johnson are definitely part of your canon. And yes, Johnson was certainly classically educated and had access to education, but Shakespeare was definitely infinitely more popular than Johnson and he was a man who had little more than grammar school education and who in some sense, like Bain herself, educated himself into a tradition, so to speak, and did not come from Oxford or Cambridge or any of these schools. but. You know, he educated himself and he was wildly popular and she says, well, if, if, if you're holding Shakespeare up to be part of your great canon and tradition, then, then certainly I can feature in because I'm, because, you know, at that point of time, her plays were doing much better than any of her contemporaries. And you, so you see her as being a very sharp, very astute woman who, with, with also a wonderful sense of humor. So you, you can, you can see that she's sort of, uh, perhaps mocking the tradition or scorning it, or not just mocking it or scorning it, but in, in a sense, she herself is pointing to ruptures in the tradition that, that is understood as being contiguous without a break, without uh, any form of rupture whatsoever. It's seen as, as a neat, streamlined kind of tradition, you know. Uh, the people who are part of this canon are certainly must be great, must have, must have had some sort of education, but she points to Shakespeare specifically and says that, well, look at him, he had very little learning uh, and he wrote only for money and only for the stage and he's done pretty well for himself and uh, his education was no measure of his success in drama. And this way you see Bain doing uh, a sort of criticism herself. She, she's looking back at the canon, she's looking at the absence of female figures in writing, uh, and, 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 and you see her not, not exactly dismissing the tradition, but like I said, pointing to breaks or ruptures in it. But despite 
despite her being able to do this, she's still a figure in a man's world and she's navigating a world with male value systems. So in this sense, she incorporates and as I mentioned earlier, she appropriates some of these instances, some of these value systems at times. Uh, remember, uh, Bain is writing at a time when Charles II has allowed women to act on stage. Now, that means that uh, there would definitely be more people coming to watch the plays because of the, uh, perhaps the uh, titillating experience of it all. But Bain would, uh, uh, would, would definitely appropriate all of this, all of these factors. She knew that a lot of the audience would be male and to ensure that she had uh, a lot of people showing up for her plays, there would always be uh, women, there would definitely be women in her place, uh, very strong women characters as well, but she would have women dressing up in men's clothes, for instance, to titillate the audience more because the sight uh, of, of, a, of, of a woman in man's clothes, in trousers specifically, where legs are delineated so clearly because they've been under skirts all this while, would uh, draw more people to her place. She would have uh, women dressing up in men's clothes, she'd have uh, uh, a lot of bedroom scenes where women would sit uh, uh, or, or would start undressing at the end of a long day and scenes like that. And she'd also simultaneously give them extremely strong speeches. So there's, there's, there's one play where she, uh, where there's, uh, there's, there, there's a girl from a lovely aristocratic family. Uh, who falls in love with uh, a character very much like uh, John Wilmot, the Earl of Rochester. He's a rake, he's licentious, but he's uh, extremely witty and humorous and good looking and all of that. And he's a favorite at court. And there's a girl from an aristocratic family who falls in love with him. You know, she's very good, she's very uh, sweet. She knows all of the, uh, she, she's well educated, things like that. In, in whatever domain it was appropriate for women of aristocratic families to be educated in, in those points of time. And there's also uh, a prostitute who's also deeply in love with uh, with this licentious uh, Rick. And uh, you you see the entire play progressing, and you see the you see the girl from the aristocratic family ending up with this Rick, with this well-educated Rick from a good family who's a favorite at court. And you see them uh, falling in love and getting married. But you also see that it is the prostitute who has the strongest speeches and the best dialogue, so to speak. And, and Bain, uh, I think, is, is simply quite ingenious at doing this because she's breaking the binary. Firstly, she's, uh, she's talking about things that were never talked about. I mean, I don't think any play in the history of uh, English literature or very few plays in the history of English literature uh, show prostitutes as human beings or as women with desires of their own, with problems of their own, who can also be good human beings. They, they were definitely cast into uh, very, very certain binaries, uh, good and bad. If you're a prostitute, you're bad, you have no morals. But Bain showed how uh, it's possible for women to perhaps take up prostitution, perhaps to enjoy it, uh, perhaps to have feelings of love themselves for men. And it's in that sense and perhaps with that motive in mind that she gives them, that she gave this uh, character such strong speeches. Because uh, at the end of the play you feel a lot of sympathy for the prostitute and you see her as a human being. And these were topics that, that Bain was dealing with that uh, no male dramatist had ever dealt with before. And it certainly shocked a lot of people. So you see her appropriating uh, the fact that people would perhaps come to watch a play where there would be cross-dressing, where there would be a lot of licentiousness in the play itself. And you see her using that to, to sort of give a voice to uh, tr trodden down uh, characters and perhaps minority characters like like prostitutes. And with regard to minority characters, you also see her doing this in Oronoku. You see that Oronoku who is, uh, is a slave who from Africa is renamed to Caesar and uh, you see Bain humanizing him extremely which was not common for, uh, for authors or playwrights in her day. All I ask is the privilege for my masculine part, the poet in me, 
to tread in those successful paths my predecessors have so long thrived in. This is another statement Bain makes in another one of her prefaces to a play. And uh, here you, you see the con not just the conflict, but you see her caught between these two worlds. On, on one hand, she's dismissed, not dismissed, but shown how easy it is to dismiss learning as any measure of success because uh, being well educated and being classically trained ensures you no success uh, on stage. And she points it out with Shakespeare and perhaps herself as well. And she shows how the majority of the literary pantheon or the literary canon is composed of males simply because they're the ones who had access to education. But at the same time, she asks for the privilege of her masculine part, which is the poet in her, to tread successful paths her predecessors have so long thrived in. Now, you see her equating uh, poetry to a male domain. You see her attributing it to men, you see her, you see that Bain views poetry as a masculine activity, as something that only men have been able to do for so long, and not just that, but been able to do very well, is what she's implicitly acknowledging in this. Or perhaps she's simply making use of this as rhetoric in order to uh, implore her readers and her critics to read her poems on an equal standard, on an equal footing, along with those of her male contemporaries, because she sees, you see her using the words, my masculine part, the poet in me. So the part of a woman that writes poetry has to be masculine because it's so long been a masculine activity, simply because it's been restricted to men who have had learning and tradition behind them, backing them up to tread in those successful paths my predecessors have so long thrived in. Poets, yes, she begs to be included among those, or she begs for her masculine part, the part of her that writes poetry is her masculine part, to be included among those who write poetry and who become part of a canon. Bain asks for this privilege. And this can be seen as, as an instance where she uh, perhaps is making use of rhetoric, perhaps believes in it because it's impossible to say what she was thinking. Documentation on her about her thoughts and her life isn't as extensive as, uh, as critics would like it to be. But, but it's these, these ruptures like this where uh, Bain fights her way into a canon, or, in, or fights her way partially into a canon, and enough to show the ruptures in the canon and in the accepted critique continuity of the canon and she points out the ruptures and she also makes use of uh, the value system that a canon makes use of in order to legitimize certain people to try and ask for the same privilege herself. Now, All of these points that we've been talking about brings us uh, or, or can in a way be used to answer, uh, not just answer, but to formulate a question about Bain's absence from a canon, which includes Dryden and Pope and Shadwell. And yet there's a simultaneous token presence in it. And I'll illustrate this with, uh, with a very quick uh, segue into English history. Um, you see, the, the Neoclassical era and the Restoration era overlap quite a bit, as do their authors. Uh, Dryden, for one, is uh, a figure who wrote, uh, who's considered a Neoclassicist and yet is quite popular on the Restoration stage. His adaptations of uh, uh, classical texts and of comedy, uh, such as Antony and Cleopatra and uh, other plays are were performed on restoration stage as restoration drama, along with Wycherley and Congreve and Afra Bain. But we also see that 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 Bain that when you with, that Bain is definitely associated with restoration drama, whereas Dryden is associated with neoclassicism as well as restoration drama. And and you see that Bain is definitely nowhere near the neoclassical canon, which is, is extremely strange because uh, the two periods overlap. They're both uh, 17th century or late 17th century in England, 
uh, restoration specifically lasted until about the 1690s, from 1660 to 1690. But neoclassicism spans uh, uh, a time before this and very definitely during this as well. But you see that the difference between neoclassicism, uh, which is commonly believed or was commonly understood as a period when texts would draw inspiration from classical texts, but the, the but texts throughout uh, the throughout literary history have been doing that. Uh, it's it's quite impossible for texts to not draw inspiration from from classical texts or from preceding texts. So, neoclassicism is specifically an era when texts imitated classical texts. They didn't simply draw inspiration from it; they imitated it. And in that sense, you see that uh, uh, that Johnson could possibly be the first neoclassicist because he trans he was classically trained and he translated a lot of uh, Latin and Greek texts into English so as to make them accessible. He translated Horace's Ars Poetica, and he also made available a translation of uh, Aristotle's criteria for drama such as the unities, the action in a play must happen uh, in the span of 24 hours across the span of a certain day and not longer than that only in a certain geographical location. He popularized this and this was followed uh, very very strictly by French neoclassicists in the 17th century. So it's about the same time as neoclassicism and the restoration era going on in England that they're going on in France as well, except French dramatists such as uh, Moliere and Racine uh, followed this to the T so to speak. But, but you'll see the reason why I'm saying all of this. But Dryden, who was also a neoclassicist in England, while he was also classically trained, uh, said that following the unities, uh, you know, like in this way to the T without any break from it, following Aristotle's laws extremely rigidly, simply led to a death of the plot and to a lot of narrowness of imagination. That's what Dryden says. And he says that plays should instruct delightfully. So. So this is a rather long-winded way of uh, pitting Dryden against Bain, both of whom were pretty much contemporaries. But you see, if, if you go back to the earlier bit where uh, where I mentioned that Afra Bain uh, sees it as pointless to argue about the value of drama, simply because drama doesn't have any value. It's entertainment even for the most erudite of minds, she says. But Dryden says that dramas should instruct delightfully. So you see him drawing from, you, you see both of them drawing from different parts of the same tradition. Uh, Afra Bain draws from Sydney and Sydney's lyricism and Dryden draws from Sydney's idea and belief that, you know, poetry, in this case drama, should instruct delightfully, should teach as well as delight. Uh, you see Dryden as advocating for uh, a break from classical standards, which is not what other neoclassicists like Pope would ever advocate, uh, breaking away from Aristotle's criteria for drama, saying that the English stage and English plays have more life in them and this should not be ruined by simply following Aristotle's ideas of unities very, very rigidly. This is not what a neoclassicist would say and yet Dryden is saying it and yet he's part of the canon. And then there's Afra Bain who's pointing out how certain figures like Shakespeare who have not been educated into a tradition and are yet part of it and yet her views are not as popular as Dryden's because quite simply it was easier to find Dryden's views on drama and he's also got an essay on dramatic poesy and it's quite, it, it, it was a lot easier to, if you do a Google search on the net, to find Dryden's views on topics such as these that than to find Afra Bain's views on topics such as these. Now that's also because uh, Dryden, of course, uh, Dryden has written uh, monographs and essays on things like uh, dramatic poesy and criticism, but we found extremely insightful views on uh, 
on the class of the time, on who has access to education and things like that. In Afra Bain's prefaces and epilogues to her plays, all of her points that I've given you about uh, the masculine part of the poet, about uh, uh, education being restricted and things like that are found in the prefaces and epilogues of her plays. So yes, she hasn't written essays or see or uh, what, what is considered quote unquote serious writings on topics like these. But nevertheless, her views are present and culling them out from her drama, culling them out from uh, what she's written as, as light-hearted drama or what is understood as light-hearted drama is an extremely interesting exercise because it provides more uh, insight into what society was like at that time, into uh, commonly held ideas of uh, decorum, education, class, standard, which uh, yes, are reflected upon and, uh, and are explained by her contemporaries who've uh, had access to education. But an unintended view or perhaps a, a subtly intended view of these topics is, is more insightful the way Bain has given them. Now, in this way, uh, a couple of quick points on Orunoku. Now, if, you've, if you're familiar with the World Literature course, you'll know that Orunoku is, uh, is a novel written by Afra Bain, uh, close to the end of the restoration period. And it was written in, in the span, I think she wrote it in one or two sittings at most. So it's, it's a very hastily written novel, but nonetheless, it is an extremely well written novel. For it's the first, it's considered to be the first prototype of an English novel. And it's also dealing with race. It's dealing with uh, a slave or, or an African prince who's captured and brought over to the West Indies, which is where Bain spent a year of her life. And Bain provides an extremely human view of it. Bain also provides uh, a, a, a rather obvious view about the savagery that's there at the heart of colonialism. Because remember, the Restoration Era follows directly, not, not directly, but follows the Elizabethan Era uh, with a couple of errors in between. Which is, and the Elizabethan Era was when colonialism was at its peak. There were explorers going out to explore, coming back with tales of new lands, with uh, with, uh, there were diaries, travelogues, memoirs being published and Bain, apart from her own travels, drew from a lot of these, I'd expect, about how the white man was uh, colonizing and conquering these territories and believing that they were bringing civilization to them. Uh, Orunoku talks about or, or, or shows how uh, the, the colored person has culture and ideas of their own and are sometimes more civilized than what the Englishman believes himself to be, than what the white man believes himself to be. And yes, this is a reading that we're doing retrospectively. Yes, these are meanings that we attribute to Bain's work retrospectively in hindsight. Nevertheless, the fact that she was able to uh, to write about this at a time when it was happening says a lot about how perceptive she was about events that were happening around her. And she was able to foresee the end that they would bring as well. Mm. Another quick uh, comment about Bain's presence in or absence in a canon is that uh, Orunoku wasn't very popular when it first came out. And uh, after, after Bain's death, which was in 1689, yes, oh yes, she died quite at the end of the Restoration Era, just at the end of it. The Restoration Era is believed to have ended in the 89 or in 1690 uh, during the glor after the Glorious Revolution. But yes, Bain died and Orunoku survived not as a novel, but it was adapted for the stage. And being adapted for the stage, it was adapted by one of her uh, younger contemporaries for the stage, who changed the ending and who made uh, who made it extremely like Othello and there's nothing and, and the implications here are obvious um, and that, that was an extremely popular play, the one he adapted to, to, uh, uh, to be mapped onto Othello exactly because this play that he adapted to the lines of Othello was far more popular than Bain's novel ever was and and, and you see Bain as surviving uh, 
as, as Dane's novel that deals with race surviving into the ages or into the first half of the 18th century at least, as this play, not as her own play, not even as her own, forget about uh, it surviving as her own novel, that, that's a far cry, it's been adapted for the stage, that's fine. But it's surviving as a play that's been adapted from something she's written and it's been adapted by a man and it's modeled, this adaptation is modeled on the lines of a play written by Shakespeare who is a very easy reference point in the tradition, he's a very easy reference point for people to understand more than Afra Bain. And, and that's how this is. Her verse doesn't survive. Her, her restoration drama is popular today, yes, but that's after revival attempts. And the one novel that she wrote, uh, the one novel that she wrote survives not as a novel, but on stage, adapted by a man, adapted to suit uh, an audience that has Shakespeare as a reference point in their tradition. And I think that there's something to be said for going back to Bain's ideas of how education is no measure of popularity because if they keep referencing back to Shakespeare, a man who had very little uh, classical education, so to speak, uh, then, then what are we to make of this tradition? Can Bain not find a place in it? Should she not be accorded a place in it? Uh, is she not to be accorded a place in it simply because she is a woman and simply because she did not fit in neatly into any of the categories of purely restoration drama, which is what Wycherley and Congreve are. They, they fit in uh, pretty uh, neatly into the categories of restoration comedy, but Bain is not simply dealing with comedy. She deals with satire, she deals with uh, a whole host of serious themes and to top it all, she's a woman. But not only has she written drama, she's uh, probably seen more of the world than her contemporaries have. She's traveled to Amsterdam and Suriname. Uh, she's written the prototype of a novel. She's written verse, uh, sometimes uh, even better than Rochester's, but still is, uh, is sort of tacked under his name. And, uh, and, and yet, she doesn't fit in neatly anywhere, and this is a huge problem for, uh, I suppose, literary periodizations and categorizations of where to place Bain, but nevertheless she must be placed. And going back to this comment is a good way to end this presentation. All women together ought to let flowers fall upon the tomb of Afra Bain, for it was she who earned them the right to speak their minds. You see Bain as a figure who's dabbled in so many different genres and so many different ways of life that she's not fit in properly into any category, into any periodization. You see her as drawing from the classical tradition of being perhaps, uh, in her verse, maybe a better neoclassicist than Dryden was. She uh, doesn't openly dismiss uh, Aristotle's three unities. Uh, it's, it's a good assumption that she was probably aware of them. But uh, you see Dryden openly dismissing them, and yet he's guaranteed a part, a place in the neoclassical canon. Uh, Bain is not, and yet her verse and follows uh, traditional structures, perhaps not traditional content, but traditional structures. And uh, I think Bain brings up a lot of questions about how we categorize authors, about how we conveniently slot them into periodizations about how it's very convenient to associate Bain with uh, bawdry restoration comedy and be done with it and oh right she's a token woman writer she's a woman writer in the restoration era but I think it would be more appropriate to say that Bain was the woman writer of the restoration era and uh, yeah I'd like to end with this quote thank you